And welcome once again to Legends of the Drowned Isles, a 5th ed D&D homebrew campaign set in the world of Omatia, but not the Omatia as you might know, it's the Omatia of the past. Of course, if you're just joining us, then it's the Omatia of now. Time travel is weird, and time zones and all kinds of things are messing all of us up, so why should I not introduce that into my campaign as well? Who am I? I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. I'm the... Uh, the uh, GM, uh, host, and uh, and you know, uh, word botherer uh, to make up all the, the world that's there. But I am wonderfully joined by my players, starting on my left with Pat. Hi, uh, I'm Pat, uh, pl and I'm playing Silas Marsh, uh, cultist delusionist. Hey, I'm Marie. I'm playing Annie, who is a rogue. And I apologize for any car alarm because it's gone off three <laughs> times now. Hey, and I'm Nax, and I'm playing Medrek, half orc cleric, who uh, might have accidentally caused the forest fire. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> accidentally. Of, speaking of alarming <laughs> things. <laughs> <laughs> Not one, two. <laughs> yeah, technically two different forest fires. We'll get to that in a moment here uh, as we uh, restart the game with a little bit of a recap. The group was hired on a mission by a local prominent businessman, Adwin, or, or, sorry, Ardwin Cartwright, to lure out the outlaw known as the Diamond. Cartwright had been building up a rumor of a shipment of expensive goods to a community by Lake Olam for a while, in hopes of attracting the attention of the bandit, in order to surprise and either kill or at least capture them. Impressed with the stories swirling around the Phoenix Champion, he sought the group out to do the task. They were sent alongside four of Cartwright's own regular caravan people in two wagons. The lean wagon was driven by a quiet, stalwart woman named Melora. In the back, both Annie and Medrick rode alongside the eager young half-orc named Petrock. Petrock, it seemed, had also heard the stories of the Phoenix Champion and was eager to fight alongside him. The second wagon was headed by Stefan, a tall, thin, stern-looking man, a bit older than the rest of them, who carried a whip to keep the horses in line. Silas rode in the second wagon alongside a half-elf named Kara, who carried a nice-looking, well-made bow. As they were crossing the stone bridge over the Olam River, a tree crashed across the road, blocking their way. Since the bridge was narrow, it would have been difficult to turn, around, turn the wagons around, but they had expected this tactic and prepared themselves for an attack. However, instead of an ambush set by bandits, they heard a loud, echoed, laughing cry the sound of several hyenas calling out, rushing the wagons. Just as the animals reached the wagons, similar cries were heard from within the woods, and the true face of this attack was seen. A pack of gnolls, the humanoid cousins of the hyenas, set, to, uh, set at the wagons. Tooth and sword clashed, and the wagon masters struggled to get control over their horses. The rest set out to defend themselves. Quickly, however, the pack surrounded them, and worse, Another knoll, very different from the rest, threw streaks of dark energy into the battle. This other knoll seemed far superior to the others, not least of which because of the magic it seemed to wield, unheard of for the animalistic knolls. Around its body hung strangs of collected bones, ghastly necklaces that rattled as it moved. Patterns swirled through its expo exposed fur, unnatural spirals and symbols that dizzied the eye to look at. The battle turned explosive, however, as Medric unleashed the full power of Ignis. Two large fireballs ripped through the hyenas and devastated the gnolls. But then two of the horses, calmed by Melora, had also been slain, and in desperation Stefan had cut loose the other two who fled. Just as this victory was achieved, Annie managed to release Graveler, the powerful earth elemental tasked by the Gyna Sphinx Cathron to help them in their quest. Soon after, however, Annie fell unconscious from her wounds. As the forest burned on both sides of the river, the desperate fight was finally ended, with Graveler, Medric, and Silas coming to the assistance of the others, who were largely gravely wounded. Silas insisted that two of the gnolls be kept alive and used his skills to staunch their bleeding. Melora and Stefan insisted on going after the horses, which had fled in opposite directions along the king's road, and were quickly lost in the choking smoke from the fires. One wagon was entirely lost to fire, and with the unnatural storms that had affected Ilthvater, the water-deprived forest seemed all too ready to burn. And that is where we find ourselves 
on the road once more with fire on both sides of the road, both sides of the river, spreading quickly through the tinder. I'll bring up the map for reference just to show what, show what I mean. You in the center here with the one wagon still, uh, still uh, functioning. And I'll just zoom out a little bit so we can see that both sides of the river have been engulfed in these rather blocky looking fires because that's the only tool that seemed to work for me at the time, but nonetheless are there. Smoke is getting thick from both of these. What are you going to do? Annie is kind of in shock and uh, like, okay, what do we do now? Like I have, I, I have a mess kit, like, why? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Sally's just making sure that the unconscious gnolls have uh, wet cloth over their mouths and noses so they can. So you're like waterboarding now? <laughs> nope, I'm keeping them alive. It should be noted that Kara went with Stefan, so he's not on his own. And Petrock, uh, I think Graveler was also sent with with uh, Melora as well. So it's just the three of you and the two uh, the two unconscious mm -hmm. ones. Silas is hoping that they don't burn to death out there, but they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, well, the horses ran towards the directions that had no fire, so clearly they're going to run in the same direction, right? Horses will just run. If they're surrounded by fire, they will run. They will run into fire. They will run out of fire. Uh, they don't think. Uh, what is uh, what is uh, Silas's animal handling skill like? Nothing. Okay. So he's not trained in it. So the horses have run off. It's uncertain exactly what will happen to them. Um. I'll try to uh, unproduce flame. See if <laughs> Ignis can help me do that. Uh, unproduce flame? Yeah. How how are you unproducing flame? Uh, so whenever I produce flame, I just do a motion like, and I think about the flame appearing, and it's like it appears. So if I put my hand towards the flame and Think of the flame reducing. Could I maybe? I don't know. Medric doesn't know if this is going to work. It's just like, well, um, it, I can make it come out. Maybe I can make it go away. <laughs> uh, roll me your percentile, please. Six. Okay. Roll me percentile again. 73. You reach out with your hand and try to absorb the flame or try to bring it back into yourself. You do find that flame flickers up along your hand and seems to waver in this strange way, almost as if it's uncertain, un, unused to this notion of, of, of not being, as the way you've called it. For instance, you feel the, the sunlight overhead beam down on you, additional heat and warmth and you can feel yourself engulfed in this flame. And briefly, you kind of get the sense that the flames wavered in, the, uh, in one of the two uh, fires, but then was returned back to its full strength. Okay. It seems as though while Ignis is the, is the, the master of fire, uh, it has no desire to stop this fire, not at least from this small plea. Okay. Don't ex I don't suppose your God lets you make water. No. Well, we got a problem. Um, who has right, well, nature fire. or survival as a skill? If you have it as a skill, go ahead and roll it now. I don't think any of us do. No. Okay. Nope. You hear now a couple of, of loud cracks as some of the the uh, mid mid sized trees in that sort of northwestern spot start to uh, collapse under the the weakening of the flame. 
Well, What's in the area that we know of? Woods. You guys haven't really ventured that far up this road. Yeah. Um, Silas can make a history check, I think, to uh, to determine what he's heard about it this way. Mm. Trying to, but it doesn't seem to want to work. <laughs> uh, maybe I have. To, uh, no, I think I just have to. Uh, I didn't restart the roll 20 page. Yeah. Uh, that? Oh, that's a pretty good roll. So you are aware that there are a number of small settlements in the area. There's a few logging camps not too far away. Um, there's a few hermits that live out in different places out here, but there's no major settlements nearby. The largest settlement besides Aelthvader back behind you would be to go all the way forward to uh, Lake Alum, and there's a number of small villages there. But that's mm -hmm. probably another hour or two away, depending on how you have been on foot, it would be even further. Well, uh, Silas is going to use uh, the thaumaturgy from the staff and make his voice real loud. And he's going to yell downstream and then upstream, uh, just repeating, uh, fire, fire, fire. Okay. Danger. Um, that'll get to any close camps, but uh, okay. hopefully it might save someone. But The voice echoes uh, off against the trees, somewhat muffled by the thickening smoke. Uh, but you are satisfied that if anyone were along the road, at least, they probably would have heard it. Uh, and it's hard to say how deep into the dense forest it would have actually echoed. But certainly, well, I'm mostly thinking up and down the river. Like if there's a logging camp, it'll be near the it'll have uh, a okay. section near the river, and any village on the river would have a dock. Okay. Um, each of you make a Constitution saving throw, please. Do we get advantage for having wet cloth over our mouths? Yeah, because we said last time that we, we all did that. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. really? Okay, I have advantage though, right? Wow, that's just as bad. You do, <laughs> but that's not much better. Well, actually, it is a bit, bit better. It's not a one, which is always scary. Yeah. Um, Maybe it's because you uh, draw some sustenance in a way out of the water in the cloth, or, or maybe it's because you're used to kind of filtering out things. Mm -hmm. uh, Silas, you're, you're not having too much difficulty breathing. For um, uh, Medric and Annie, however, it's causing you to rack and cough. Uh, you have one level of exhaustion as the air is kind of getting sucked out of your lungs. And it's having, you're having a hard time, your eyes are watering. Exhaustion is probably the easiest way to model that. Uh, if Silas notices that, he's going to tell him that we need to get you down into the river as close to the, uh, down into the water as you can. There'll be less smoke there. Yeah. And <laughs> this is embarrassing. He'll try to start uh, hauling one of the knolls uh, down. All right, they are pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, make it, I'll help uh, him. A strength check. Are you are both helping on the same one, or are you both doing different ones? Uh, same one. Okay. Between mm -hmm. the two of you, it's not so difficult to carry it down. But it's considerably stronger too. Uh, the other one's kind of, kind of coughing and wheezing, uh, already pretty badly wounded, uh, having some difficulty. Um, as you kind of come down to the river, are you just sort of? Tossing it into the river? What are you doing? No. Nope. Uh, Silas will uh, we'll have to bring it into the river, and then Silas will go and hold it near the side. So we're basically laying in the water with our head, <coughs> heads out near the riverbank. And so bring the other one down. We've got to keep them alive so we can question them. And 
and he's not going to be much help with this, so she's just going to stay by the water. <laughs> Yeah, the first one you brought down seems to be kind of almost uh, choking a bit. Uh, not quite waking up still, but sort of uh, having a hard time. The other one seems to be quieter breathing, and you're concerned at the moment that maybe it had passed away, but it seems like it's 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 able to sort of filter out through its, its dog-like mouth and the extra hair around its mouth, uh, sort of filtering out a little bit of, of, the, uh, of the, the water, or sorry, of the smoke. And you drag both of them down there. Um, oh, I see the condition thing came up. Uh, do you? Uh, what else are you doing? You're kind of pulling yourselves into the water or keeping yourselves by there. The smoke is thick, but because of the, the steep banks of the of the water and the water itself kind of continually moving on, it does create a sort of channel of uh, of breathable air flowing through. The water itself is quite cold, um, fresh water actually as well. Uh, yes, actually, I know what I can do. Uh, Silas casts water breathing on the entire group. Okay. And then uh, now you can stay down in the water uh, and no fire at all. Just try not to get swept down the river. My ar my armor is going to prevent that from happening. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to nap underwater. <laughs> The opposite side of Medric. <laughs> <laughs> so Medric is your your blocker for the. Uh, <laughs> uh, as you kind of crawl into the river and kind of get down into the water, the the river is pretty chill or pretty cool. Um, it it is not truly a heavily swiftly moving river at this particular point. It might have something to do with the fact that there is a large rock right there, uh, so it actually provides a little bit of an extra breakwater. You can kind of easily find yourselves uh, just kind of tucked up against it not carried down the river and you move under under the water and and uh, kind of consider how long you might have to wait um yeah. and periodically silas will do the the yelling fire thing again okay um each of you make a perception check the two knolls by the way once you drag them under the water they did sort of twitch and and shake uh as if alarmed, their bodies naturally not understanding exactly what's going on. Um, neither seem to wake, however. Okay. Someone's car is being stolen again. That's just the sound of... That's the echo of, uh, of Silas's uh, scream on the tree. Somehow it gets <laughs> twisted and distorted coming back as just a periodic... That's Ooh. seriously the fourth time since we, we've been on this call. <laughs> Quick, the, the, the bandits are trying to steal the car. It must be the diamond. It's the only explanation. Medric, <laughs> um, as you're under the water and kind of watching, and it's it's weird for you to be under the water again, especially when you were so recently covered in flames, and you can yeah. kind of feel your entire body heating a little bit, trying to modulate the temperature between the the cold water around you and your internal, natural, quite warm uh, body. Uh, and then there's a sort of sharp pain that you feel, uh, and you're not quite certain exactly where it's coming from. Uh, and you kind of quickly pull back your hand, realizing that it's, it is chilled cold. And as you, you, uh, you look over in that direction towards the, the, uh, the northern bank of the river at that particular point, you realize that the surface of the river is kind of clouded over, and under the water, there's a little tiny, uh, tiny, uh, uh, well, from your perspective, like little little uh, spikes that get inserted into the river every once in a while, and then kind of pick up a little bit stronger uh, until they kind of leave a little bit of, of, of a, almost a solid substance behind them, dripping and dropping in, in through and breaking the surface of the water until eventually, uh, they sort of stop as the cloud grows very strong over that part of the river. What do you do? Wait, what? <laughs> so there's like a cloud of stuff above the water? Or? So from your perspective, beneath the water, it looks as though a, a segment of the water not far away has sort of clouded over a top. And there were things falling through until the cloud became more solid. I'll stick my head out and it's like... 
I'll swing the hammer at it. <laughs> okay. As in, like, like, not like an attack, but just like, get the fuck out of here, kind of swing. Okay. You pop your head above the water. The smoke is still fairly thick, is almost a cloud over, overhead of you. But you immediately hear the sound of sort of hissing, very loud, strong, continual hissing, which is confusing at first. You reach out with the hammer and tap that part of the water and realize that it's glassed over. A little bit of ice is formed. And as you look up the side of the, the, the bank, you see that there is little pockets of ice that have formed that are, are, are uh, kind of slowly covering over the, uh, the side hill, making it extraordinarily slippery. You look left and right and realize this is happening, from your perspective, at about, I'm going to say about a 10-foot uh, width uh, and not happening on either side. The water moving along is kind of pulling at this, this ice that's formed. And sort of keeps I'll, continually uh, forming. Notify Annie and Silas, like tap them on the shoulder, point to the thing. That looks weird. You're muted, Silas. Is a cloud in the water attacking us? No. Yeah, and it's there's, got sharp little edges. There's, there's ice forming on the surface of the water, and as you watch, you note. Uh, more and more drops of what look like frozen rain coming from the sky, landing on top of the water. They don't pierce anymore because the top yeah. has become solid. And the entire side hill now is being pelted by, by freezing rain that is in some places growing solid and making the surface slick, other places just sort of sinking in. And as all three of you raise your heads above the water, you hear that same sort of hissing sound and realize it's the sound of water pouring on fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and say, okay, let's get out. Somebody's here. Or let's go under the Somebody bridge, because this hail is painful. Um, uh, Silas is going to whatever side of the bridge is, or whatever side of the river is uh, away from the fire. So the northern side of the river, just about there, is where the tip of this effect seems to be happening. And as you as you move back a little bit and, and start to climb up the other side, you can see that it's sort of taking in a little bit of the edges of the bridge as well. Uh, and the, f the, the smoke is turning more almost to a fog as, as cold and rain uh, collide with hot and, and smoke. The smoke is starting to be called out. And you can see this massive effect. Uh, it must be 30 or 40 feet wide going up and above and into the smoke. Uh, as the entire area seems to be engulfed in this, this heavy rain. You're confused at, at the moment as well because you can still feel the sunlight beating down on you from the cloudless sky, except for that one spot that seems to be among the, the, uh, the fire itself. You also all hear the uh, sounds of several, several people shouting. Uh, sounds like in common. Uh, a couple of, of uh, male voices, a couple of female voices uh, shouting back and forth. Uh, and very quickly, you also hear the sound, uh, kind of a loud kathok, 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 uh, the rhythmic uh, hammering or the rhythmic chopping of wood. A few seconds later, you hear the distinct crack of a tree, and uh, you can hear more than see a tree fall somewhere in the inside of where that conflagration had been uh, burning. Mm -hmm. uh, Silas will yell out loudly, yeah. Uh, uh, Hello. Um, it's a little hard to be heard with all the noise there, but you do hear a response back. Uh, hello, hello. And uh, you, hear, you see someone uh, kind of run onto the, the edge of the road, uh, soaking wet, um, a dwarf with, uh, with now quite damp looking uh, red hair and a, and a three uh, braid beard wielding a, uh, an axe that's almost bigger than he is uh, wide head about uh, about two feet wide uh, looks like it's a pretty rough looking axe it's not uh, fancy or anything uh, and he kind of started to come come running up the road um, outside of the effect and kind of running up towards you mm. um, well Silas will say uh, at least one of us should stay here guarding the knolls. Uh, and then he'll run off towards the dwarf saying, what can we do to help? And the, 
Dorse kind of running up to you, a little bit out of breath. You get the impression that he ran a lot just now. Um, have you got an axe or anything you can cut trees down? We've got to get the periphery down so the whole place doesn't burn. Uh, not an axe, but I might be able to knock some trees down. Let's get to it then. And he kind of runs right by you, crosses over the bridge, looks at the at the, the burning wagon. It's still on fire, although mostly smoldering at this point as it's kind of collapsed on, in on itself. Shakes his head and starts to run uh, even further down, um, trying to get beneath and around this particular southern fire. And he calls back over his, over his uh, shoulder as well. Um, Veer, we've got another one. Bring that damn magic over here. Yeah, Silas will follow him. Okay. Uh, I'll also say we have knows. a... What's that? Medrick will guard the gnolls, probably. Okay. Uh, Silas will tell them, we've got a couple of gnoll prisoners down under the bridge. Gnolls? And, uh, Never known them to set too many fires. Hell, no, no, to run away from a small match. Wasn't them, it was us. It was an accident. There's a double take, uh, kind of that 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 sort of look of, oh really? And there's a mm -hmm. deep, deep sigh without a, without a word. What do you need knocked down? And he starts pointing at several of the trees. That one's on the edge. If you get that one, knock it. If you can, in towards the rest of the fire. Uh, we'll start seeing if we can dig a, a better trench around here. Okay. I can help dig. Go to it, lass. And Silas will just charge up his staff and start booming, striking the trees. Okay, that's that's the trees don't move, so the latter part isn't isn't happening. But the initial no. strike certainly will uh, will start to weaken the trees. Uh, in between your strikes, um, the uh, dwarf uh, wields this this heavy heavy axe, and it kind of it it goes very very quickly for each one you double time. Uh, but you're still losing a little bit of, of uh, ground against the fire. You can feel the, the flicker and flames uh, uh, of, of these dry and tindered trees uh, 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 heating up your sides and heating up your skin. Uh, the dwarf uh, uh, wiping his brow every once in a while and at one point even pulls back and, and kind of tamps out his beard a little bit, get a little too close to one of the flames. Um, coming, running around the other side, uh, Annie, you're also pitching in somehow? I'm helping dig. Dig? Okay. I have a shovel in my, my kit, so. Would there be a way to call Graveler back? Because I'm assuming he'd be good at knocking shit over. Uh, unfortunately, he's out of earshot range at this particular Correct. point. Because you sent him along to uh, to help out with Melora. Silas! Uh, can you yes. do the voice thing to call Graveler back? I'll try. I'll go him, but... Uh... Uh, Silas will ask uh, the dwarf to cover his ears for a second and then bellow in the direction that uh, uh, Graveler went, uh, just saying, Graveler, return. Okay. You know, uh, sure. also, uh, oh, yeah, uh, he'll try using, uh, he's got Prestidigitation and Druid Craft, so he'll be using those to snuff small sections of fire. Uh, it's yeah it's like candles uh worth but mm -hmm. it can help put out little little branches here and there yeah well it's well it's up to a small campfire uh but uh he'll use it just like on individual trees or something that aren't too close to the rest of the fire yeah you find it's, it's difficult to target because every time you snuff one section out it relights from the sides but um, you make a bit, a bit more progress on that you're not sure if graveler heard what you had to say you're not sure how far nope. exactly he is at this point um, but, uh, uh, the, uh, the dwarf is also kind of pointing at you, Annie, and just sort of telling you, dig here, dig there. Um, all of you make a, uh, a, uh, let's see, a survival roll, please. For both of you. Uh, one of you can choose to have advantage as the dwarf is helping you, but you have to decide which one of the two of you. If I'm just starting guarding the gnolls, I don't have a draw. I'm, I mean, no, it's, I it's currently have for... disadvantage because of exhaustion, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can take it. I get a three. Yeah. Unfortunately, fighting forest fires is not something that you are either experienced with uh, or mm -hmm. trained to specifically do. 
Um, I might switch to real dice at this point. Like I've not rolled above a five. I've, I've had this experience the other day. It was quite disturbing. Uh, and dice are, are evil. Um, unfortunately, you're, you're finding that uh, you're not able to dig quite fast enough to make the, uh, the, the, the pit that seems to be needed. And one of the large trees uh, falls over, kind of spreading the fire a little bit further. Uh, once again, the dwarf yells out, Veer, get your shiny ass over here. Uh, it's kind of lost in the fire crackling and the smoke. Uh, but, uh, Medric, are you sticking, keeping your head below water, or are you watching what's going on? I'm watching. Okay. Um, you see an elf uh, come running uh, around the other side, kind of actually almost running right straight through the uh, forest up here. Um, very dark green uh, clothing. Uh, dark hair, dark green uh, skin as well, but with kind of a coppery tinge. Um, uh, looks very, very serious and comes charging around. And it's hard to tell from this distance, but you get the impression he's a little bit surprised by the second fire. They may not have noticed that one until uh, the dwarf came running around. And uh, just have to check on that spell. Uh, I think that will reach from there. Oh yeah, no problem at all. You see her her raise her hands to the uh, to the sky, uh, and uh, call out something. Um, does that do any of you know Elvin? Nope, not me anyway. Uh, Annie knows Elvin. Um, Annie, you recognize it as a as an, an an old Elvin word, not even kind of the modern tongue. It's it's a very old Elvin word. Uh, it simply is a, an appeal to the sky, um, but it it, it it's weird. It's not an appeal in terms of commanding it. It's an appeal as in a request of nature. Uh, and above all of you on the other side, uh, Annie, uh, Silas, and this dwarf, um, you can hear the sort of sound of thousands of tiny little droplets of water falling out of the sky, colliding with the, the uh, trees where they're on fire. They just kind of burn away instantaneously. But it starts to get heavier and heavier. And you see the area around you start to grow not only uh, uh, wet, but um, but slick as well. You start to see your breath in front of your faces, and the chill kind of flows through the area as well uh, as she summons down whatever she had used before to pound down upon the area. Um, the dwarf gives out a, a loud whoop and stands back kind of out of it. Uh, now that'll get it and then directs the two of you to start chasing after some of the smaller branches that are kind of outside of the range or just on the edge or starting to catch fire. Um, that I, can, I can do my best to do that. Um, I'll take another survival roll from Silas and Annie. And again, one of you can take an advantage because the dwarf is directing you. Uh, that can be Annie. Okay. Uh, Oh my god. <laughs> I'm going to go get real dice, y'all. You do have advantage. You get one more roll. I'm exhausted. I get... Uh, it oh, yeah. Brings it me just to brings you back to normal. That's right. Uh, unfortunately, through the between the, the extra smoke in your lungs and the, and the difficulty and the shock of the situation, the unfamiliarity of putting out fires, you have a hard time kind of making any headway. Um, you're confused because at times the dwarf is yelling out dig and other times he's, he's yelling out to dump the dirt on the fire and you find yourself digging at the wrong time and dumping the dirt at the wrong time. It doesn't seem as though the dwarf is angry, just kind of uh, uh, eager to make sure that this gets done and kind of hops in to help you from time to time. He's not angry, he's just disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not even disappointed. Uh, it's, it's as though he kind of expected this. Okay. Uh, uh, Medric, in the meantime, are you are you doing anything? This is going to take a few minutes. Uh, I'm not like I just don't want the, the prisoners to wake up and then yeah. run away. So you're sticking by them. Yeah. Do I see any sign of Graveler? Uh, not yet. Okay. You do hear another loud crack, uh, and the others can hear it, but you're the one that can actually see that it comes from within the uh, forest once more, closer to the road this time, as uh, it looks like one last tree that may have had some embers burning it goes falling down. 
Uh, and now that the smoke is starting to clear, the effect of the of the storm uh, that was the instantaneous storm that was brought in is starting to uh, to reduce. Uh, you do make out sort of somewhat shadowed in the 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 uh, the mist, the, in, the ensuing mist between the heat and the water, uh, a rather tall figure who uh, seems to be falling falling following behind the tree that just fell down and uh, and hammering at it with a a, a large one-sided axe uh, again just a silhouette of a figure uh, probably pretty tall fairly thin uh, roughly uh, uh, masculine shaped if you will okay. um, but you don't see any detail from there so there's three helpers total now that you've seen yes okay um, you do hear them call out um, to uh, to other people. The voice is a little bit raspy, uh, almost as though it's it's uh, a little bit worn, uh, but but uh, what moderated tone, kind of the the tone almost of command, uh, yells out for um, Marta and Dale um, to uh, to walk the rock the periphery, make sure it's out. Um, after about five to ten minutes of the rain pouring down and the efforts uh, to put out the forest fire, it looks as though it has come out. And the uh, dwarf uh, sits down on a rock nearby, takes his uh, now very, very soggy uh, uh, woolen hat, his knit woolen hat off, gives it a squeeze to get get rid of the water, and then sort of uses it to mop up some of the, some of the, the, uh, the soot and uh, sweat on his forehead. Oh, well, that was terrible. I always hate for fighting forest fires. Ah. That it was. Uh, Silas will dry him off and then clean him up. Oh, nice. I'll uh, drag the prisoners out of the water now that the fire's gone. Um. Okay, they seem to be still unconscious. Um... Everybody's rolling low today. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I've seen it happen. Just kind of, I, yeah, I've had weeks like that sometimes. Uh, the uh, the dwarf kind of kind of in the 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 weird magic that you give. It, it's almost as though he's seen this sort of magic before, uh, and he's just kind of leaning into it, kind of pulling out his beard to make sure it's fluffed out a little bit, uh, and and uh, and dry. Even gives it a bit of a of a twist to dry it up a little bit more. Thank I'll you. I'll do that for. I'll do that for the others as well if they haven't been around. Okay. It is the absolute least we could do since this was our problem. We'll say you reconvene on the on the bridge uh, by the not burning wagon. The other one is nothing more than smoldering em embers at this particular point. Um, of the uh, of the people you've seen so far, the dwarf uh, does walk up with you and kind of walks across the bridge. Um, the tall. Uh, uh, man that uh, Medrick had seen comes out of the smoke, uh, stands uh, quite tall, in fact, pretty uh, th thin, broad-shouldered. His skin is a deep uh, tan, bronze almost, um, light brown hair that's uh, sort of uh, chopped short at the temples. You can see a little gray, uh, actually, at the temples as well. Permanent five o'clock shadow. You get the impression he probably always has a five o'clock shadow. He's one of those uh, with a... Uh, a a very square uh, chiseled jaw across which you see a nasty white scar that runs from it looks like from the from the top of his left ear all the way down and across his cheek um, but he seems to have uh, quite a smile on his face despite the the uh, the small uh, ash markings and and uh, and so forth um, wearing a very loose tan shirt got some uh, some uh, uh, I guess they would be the equivalent of jeans in, in the medieval mm -hmm. world. Um, and a very, very large, uh, long-handled, single-bladed axe, which he kind of just props across, across his shoulders and props his arms on as if he's stretching. Uh, and he's kind of walking towards you. The elf uh, that you saw before is staying back and uh, glaring daggers at all of you. Um, you're not exactly sure what her, her uh, feeling is. She doesn't say anything. Uh, but just kind of stays back about 30 feet and, and stands with her her uh, arms crossed and her legs uh, kind of shoulder-width apart, standing there, uh, very much judgmental. 
from the woods not far from where uh, the tall human uh, was comes uh, two more humans, uh, a young, uh, a, well, I guess I still call them human, but a very pale-skinned, uh, tall, muscular woman, uh, you presume might be Marta that he called to before. Uh, in the if in the D and D parlance, this would be a Goliath, but I I subclass them under human. Um, not entirely dissimilar to Lild, who you met a little bit a little bit ago. Um, again, kind of has these uh, dark angular tattoos over her uh, exposed arms, um, and uh, a, a thick, short, dark mohawk is the only hair on her skin. Uh, very thick leather gloves. She's carrying um, what looks to be a uh, a a strange sort of axe. Um, it looks, it's a cross between a uh, pole arm and an axe, and it's double bladed, one blade on each end. Um, you imagine that that could be incredibly useful and very dangerous at the same time. And along with her is a, a, uh, a, a short, much younger than the rest human um, with a short pointed uh, blonde beard and floppy blonde hair. Uh, seems to have a permanent uh, grin onto one side. Um, large sleeves uh, that were probably uh, pretty fancy at one point, but now with wear and tear seem to have faded. And now you can see the little burn marks on a couple of spots there as well, um, carrying uh, what looks to be a shovel, uh, as well as has a, a uh, rapier on his uh, on his belt, no less. Uh, and the, those, uh, so Marta and uh, the other one he called to Dale, and this human walk forward, and the dwarf stands there as well. Um, the, uh, the human walks forward, the tall one walks forward and, uh, looks between the, the, the group of you, uh, looks towards the knolls and kind of nods, uh, has a, a, a wry grin almost on his face. Um, I really didn't think they were going to be starting fires. And the dwarf kind of booms out, not them. It was these guys. Oh, yes. Unfortunately. Oh, we got it out. Yeah. Well, it's galled, by the way. He extends his hand. He extends his hand to Silas, kind of seeing him almost as the, the, the prominent one. Where's Annie in all this? Um, she was... I'm probably, I, I've, I've been just like flailing and actually doing anything, so I'm probably like catching my breath in the back somewhere. <laughs> yeah, and there's... There's that heavy smoke that's still in your lungs as well, so it's kind of making you cough every once in a while. Um, he introduces himself as Gauld. He shakes uh, Silas's hand. It's a very firm, strong handshake. Um, yeah, Silas shakes it. Thank you uh, so very much. We were unprepared for dealing with this. The knolls, yes, but the fire, not so much. He kind of squints his eyes at, uh, at you, Medric. Seems kind of a strange thing to say for a follower of Ignis. And he extends his hand to you nonetheless. Yeah. I'll, I'll shake his hand. I'm Medric. Warm to the top. Apologies about the uh, fire. Yeah, well, it's... I tried to aim it at the knolls, but uh, wind, you know... He, he looks around at the at the piles of, of uh, <laughs> burning gnolls and hyenas. I think you still hit them. Still, might want to be careful out here. Uh, as I said, my name is Gauld. That's uh, Marta, pointing at the tall uh, Goliath. Dale, the uh, younger man. That's Jordy. And the uh, dwarf kind of waves. Nice to meet you all. Um, you are... Uh, my name is Silas. This is uh, Medric and Annie. Does um, what have we heard of druids or forest magickers? Um, like, would we know are, anything about them? Druids are known. Um, they aren't very commonly seen in in uh, in towns, uh, and if they are seen, no one knows that they're a druid. They don't seem to be standing out themselves. Uh, mm. But they are known to be guardians of the woods, guardians of nature, um, kind of a, a wandering group sometimes. You never know when you're going to find a druid. They probably never intend to. The angry weather controlling magic user that uh, seems angry at us specifically. Um, 
Could they be a druid? Are you, is this Silas speculating? Uh, this is Silas wondering before he goes to apologize to them. Oh, um, given the amount of water ma or weather magic that was just displayed, uh, given that they're um, clearly angry at the fire, <laughs> I think that would be a pretty safe bet. Mm. Um, they're also dressed uh, in a way that would almost blend into the forest if they weren't standing on a road. Yeah. Uh, Silas is going to uh, walk over to them and uh, say, she, um, eye, she eyes you suspiciously, and, and if you get closer than 10 feet, she backs up. He'll stop if she starts to back up. I uh, said, My apologies. This is not a situation we're used to fighting in, and we let it get, a, get beyond us. When she speaks, her voice has a, an accent you're not familiar with, but she does speak common. Um, oh, boy -o. No. <laughs> Curse you for even introducing that idea. Uh, your character dies instantly on the spot. He's <laughs> used to it. <laughs> um, no, it, it's, it's something... You can't place it. You haven't traveled that far, um, but you've heard different travelers who've come through the port um, speak somewhat like this. Uh, but she says very, very sternly, You were careless. You should not have lived. We would not have if my friend hadn't you know, let loose, unfortunately. But we fixed your no problem. She kind of sniffs at, at but, that. Yeah, Silas looks sharply back at Medrick. <laughs> He's got the it's definitely a not helping goals. look. <laughs> um, Gaul um, kind of looks over his shoulder at you um, and, look, and looks back at the group. Uh, she's going to be holding that grudge for a while. There's not much I can do about that, but I'll try to talk to her. Honestly, though, it was a little bit, was a little bit careless. It was very careless. The woods around here. Well, the alternative was all of us dying. So there is I that. do apologize for the damage, but on the other hand, no, you, we, what you had to do. That's yeah. understandable. That's all of us. That's anything. It's the only thing any of us can really do. Is what we need to do. Veer, go easy on him, would you? She does not. I'm, I'm assuming. Hmm. I'm assuming you heard Silas's call about the fire. Make an uh, into, uh, insight check, please. Damn it. Papers. Peppers? Okay. You don't need no peppers. Fox sakes. Everybody. Heard Every Nobody's that. rolling about five today. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's kind of ironic. Um, everybody heard that. It was um, a lot louder than most of us are expecting, but we could see the fire from where we were anyway. Luckily, we weren't too far away, and luckily, this is the sort of thing that we deal with from time to time. So, we did try to fix the problem. Yeah, and Just you did what you could. Well, at least your friends did. I guess you had other, other things to do, and he kind of gestures towards the two unconscious knolls by your feet. Yeah, we need to hold them for questioning. Questioning? Uh, if you think you can get much out of a knoll, you're, well, better than I am. They don't have much for language. They don't have much for anything. Still, something seems different about these ones. We've been noticing some strange things lately. I guess the knolls attacking is just another sign of that. What, what kind of strange things? Um, well... I don't really want to stand around here and talk about it. we got to clear this bridge off if other people are going to be coming through. But, All right. Uh, there are some creatures roaming the woods that I've never seen before. I don't think anybody has. That's not Could you good. describe some of them? I'll get to work on, like, clearing the wagon debris. 
Um, he gestures over as uh, at uh, Marta uh, to also help with her much more muscles than he has even, uh, and trying to trying to 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 shove and wrestle and carefully deconstruct the pile of of wood that was once the uh, wagon, pushing it off the other end of the uh, of there. Haven't gotten close enough yet to see most of them. Been trying to keep away from anything that seems too big. I mean, I might be able to take on a bear. No, you cannot. You hear Veer from a lot farther away. You shouldn't. She shouldn't really have heard that. Um, but she seems to be correcting him. Oh, well, maybe not a bear, but these are much, much bigger than that. I could hear them tramping through the woods. Didn't want to get too close. There's something strange going on. Not far from here. The fens. Uh, they're not a place that I would go regularly anyway, but... Well, let's just say I, I, I can feel it, even if I can't see it. Same. I can also feel darkness growing around Elthodder. There's been darkness in Elthodder for a long time. Starts at the top, if you ask me. A different darkness. A different one? How many darknesses do you need? As little as possible. We, we hope that these two, and I'll point towards the preservers, will have information. We're counting three of them so far. Three. The darknesses, that is. Well, I'm pretty sure it starts with the top. But... I don't get involved in politics. You both can make a... Actually, all three of you can make an insight check. Is it going to be above a five? I mean, I can't help you with that. That's more than above a five. 15. That's definitely above a five. Yeah. Silas actually isn't over there. He's over in the... Four. He's Four. over in the, the, nice. near the burned trees, looking for stuff like pine cones and seed pods and such. And he's using uh, druid craft to pop them open so that the seeds can plant. Okay. Um, Medric, you, you noted a sense of bitterness in, uh, in Gald's voice um, whenever he's mentioned the starting at the top. Um, mm -hmm. There's definitely some bitterness there, but you're not sure exactly what it is. Um, I'll tell him, like, you're, you're not wrong. <laughs> Uh, Veer watches what you're doing and is a little bit surprised. At first, you see her kind of flinch a little bit when you pick up some of the pine cones. As if you were, you get the impression maybe she was thinking you were picking up uh, souvenirs or something like that, or or or, or some sort of you're not sure what uh, trophy yeah. or souvenir. Uh, but when you release the the seeds, um, she walks closer. How do you know to do that? It's what I've been taught. Who taught I'm you? not like you, but I do have some connection to some forms of nature. You were taught by a druid? No. No, I was taught by the mother. Hmm. Um... A... Not likely a name that they would have heard at all. No. But uh, um, I, I know this isn't much, but it may help. You're not doing it right. And she kind of picks up one of the pine cones and doing basically the exact same thing you were. But there's a bit about the way that she's spreading the seeds and the way that she's kind of picking the soil in which the seeds will go. There's, there is some knowledge there. And she's, yep. she's kind of impatiently showing you the right thing to do. Almost begrudging. Sorry, sirens. Yeah, he'll follow it. Yeah, I think uh, fire trucks here. Yeah, sirens yeah. and car alarms. And I'm sure there's going to be a dog on an engine somewhere. I mean, they're a little late to put out the fire, but I mean, they're trying. Right? <laughs> yeah, he'll follow her instructions Okay. to the best of his ability. Okay. He's not a farmer. Uh, after a while... The, you do come across a few unfortunate sights. Looks like a few birds were caught up in the fire, didn't didn't get away. Um, and she uh, 
picks one of them up and kind of dusts off the the uh, the soot, um, kind of cleans it a little bit, and then buries it um, with a, a bit of a moment, a bit of a pause, a quiet prayer or something that she she said over the over the uh, body of it. And he'll do likewise. Okay. He'll uh, poof, clean bird, bury bird. Poof, exploded bird. <laughs> Kaboom! Whoops, and he can't spell. do that. Booming blade. Boom. Um, she seems to grow more appreciative of, of this gesture, although she's definitely still um, bearing a grudge. And y y she points out several of the, of the seed pods and, and uh, cones and things like that for you to, to work on. And it seems as though she's directing to you at the ones which are the most annoying ones to get at. There's still a bit of a smoldering branch over this one, or this one's at an awkward angle because of a tree that's over top of it that doesn't quite fall over, but you get the impression that it probably could have at any time. Um, she's definitely yep. putting it in the faces. Um, where is Annie during all of this? Just sort of hanging around? Yeah, she's probably catching her breath and trying, like, kind of puttering around trying to help but she can't really do much um dale uh, this is kinda... uh, way out of her area of expertise sure uh dale comes over to you and and uh, uh kind of strokes his his uh sort of triangle small little goatee essentially a blonde goatee um you look like someone familiar and also like hell Yeah, yeah, I get that. <laughs> I get just the thing. And he reaches uh, back and pulls out a, a small little uh, flask, like a, not a flask, mm -hmm. but a, um, uh, a wine skin, essentially. Take a swig mm -hmm. of this. It'll do you some good. I'll do it. Okay. Um, to Annie's perhaps um, elevated historical senses, this is a really, really cheap red wine. In the moment, it flows pretty smoothly, and you find your cough lifting somewhat. Um, the level of exhaustion is removed. Ooh. And he takes it back, smiles appreciatively, and uh, takes a swig himself. Ah, make it myself. I want to get a chance. Nice. It's hard to find just the right berries, you know. Veer won't point them out to me, so I have to go digging for myself. Name's Dale, if you didn't catch it. You are... Annie. Annie. And he, he bows extravagantly to you. In a way that you feel weirdly reminiscent of Court, but he's a, a ragged uh, logger in the middle of the forest. Um, you get the impression that it was kind of an, an, an exaggerated gesture. You're not sure for whom's, who's benefit necessarily. I, I just laugh a little. What brings you to the middle of the forest looking for gnolls? Surely there are better things to do. Well, we weren't looking for gnolls. We were guarding this caravan. The rest of the group has gone to look for the horses. Caravan? Must be something really valuable. What is it? And he kind of walks over to the back of the wagon, peers in. All you can really see from here is a large uh, stone, because the summoning stone for uh, for uh, Graveler is still back <laughs> there. Graveler is there. As well as the crates that aren't opened. Not much back here. Must mean it's, no. uh, what, gold? Jewels? Something like that? Better yet, Brandy? We weren't told what was in it. I'm assuming we I were like just told to make sure. Hmm? We were just make, told to make sure it gets where it needs to get. Huh. Shame to die and not know what it was for, you know, or I should say almost die. Apparently it did pretty well for yourself. And he kind of gestures again at the sort of still sort of steaming bodies of numerous gnolls and hyenas piling up here. They're going to smell pretty soon too, by the way. Yeah, um, I could burn them further, but I'm assuming your friend over there is going to be upset with that. I mean, if you don't light the entire forest on fire, she's probably going to be fine with it. Although maybe can... a burial, I don't know. 
We can probably set up higher in a. Actually, I'm, never mind. I'm over down the road talking to Druid. So I'll ask her exactly where she wants it. Maybe she'll be less angry with me then. So you're going to chase after Veer? Not yet. Um, I'm still talking to Dude. Uh, okay. By the way, uh, is she any good with animals? <laughs> Could she get our horses back if we can't manage it ourselves? I mean, I've been called a lot of things, but I, I'm, I'm not sure if an animal is quite the qualification. If you mean <laughs> regular animals, then yeah, she's pretty good. She's always been a little bit more comfortable about around them than people, for that matter. All right. And you saw the horses streaking away. Someone's going after them? Yeah. And the rest of our group. No. I hope they're doing okay. Some of them were pretty banged up. I guess everybody was. Uh, the woods are generally not too bad. I wouldn't go tromping through them without some precautions, but if they're sticking to the road, they should be fine. There are bears and uh, wolves and, well, hyenas. A lot of other natural things out here. There's a few owl bears up by Cedar Ridge, I hear, but I haven't gone that far in a long time. I'd stick close to the camp most of the time. Mm -hmm. Makes sense not to wander off too much. Yeah, it's hard not to. Veer can't help herself. And if Veer's going somewhere, I can't help myself either. That's, by the way, this has been Gold speaking for the most part. Uh, I'll try to play Dale and Gold somewhat different. Um, Gold has a little <laughs> deeper voice. Dale's a little more flippant. Um, and so do you guys point, live around here? At this point, you also notice, Annie, that Dale is taking an interest in these boxes that are back here and kind of looking to see if any of them have easily pryable lids. Huh? Are you muted? I, I, I think she's pantomiming at the moment. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm like, hey, my, my, my job is to make sure that nobody opens these. But you don't even know what's in them. I mean, it could be, I don't know, shredded old shorts. Could be full of I'm rocks. paid well. I'm being paid well to make sure nobody opens them. What's in them doesn't matter. I suppose, still. We could ask the rest of the group when they get back. Maybe they know. I mean, we could or just maybe they don't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't hurt anybody. Nobody would know. And then you'd know. Yeah, but I would know, and I'm getting paid to make sure nobody knows. <laughs> well, that seems like hardly any fun. I share my uh, my drink with you, and I can't even take a peek at the crates. I mean, and he gives you a wink. <laughs> Nope, no one's opening these crates while I'm I'm watching them. You hear Gall to call out, Dale, leave the girl alone, and leave the crates alone, too. Uh, I was just curious, that's, you know, it's not a crime to be curious. Unless Do you guys live around here? It. Yeah, the um, Rabbit Hollow. It's, and he kind of gestures up the road. No, a, a bit of a ways up that way. It's typically where we're found, but... Out for some scavenging. Trying to get some things from the forest. Are you the only ones at that settlement? Oh no, it's a full camp. Okay, about, about blocking dozen, camp, right. About a dozen of us in total. Yeah. Um, we specialize in ironwood. It's hard to find. And Vera knows how to find it. Cool. All right. Speaking of Vera, I should I uh, go ask her what to do with the bodies or where to burn them safely? Uh, can you make sure that if these things wake up, they don't run away or anything? I'm assuming they're tied up. Yeah, they are. Okay. I think you did. Yeah. Um, okay. I can watch I them. Yeah, they're both tied up. One with the unbreakable rope. Okay. Okay. Um, Gold kind of stands by them, um, un, un uh, or lifts the axe off of his shoulders, kind of been just holding it there, and sets it down kind of beside him. The axe handle itself is almost uh, three and a half feet long. It's quite a. That's is that long enough? No, about four feet long. 
Um, it's a very, very long uh, axe handle with a, a very large single-sided blade on it. Cool. It's not hard and to I'll find go... Vir because you can find Silas right, right next to her. And she's again kind of pointing out all these things. Um, she notices you before you get very close at all and kind of stands back a little bit, keeping keeping her distance. Watching yeah, you I won't her. like... Yeah, I won't like go too close to her. Uh, there. She looks at you suspiciously and just nods. Uh, the corpses of the Noels and hyenas are gonna have an un unbearable stench soon, according to your friend. And we should dispose of them so no scavengers come and cause trouble. Uh, where is the safest spot to burn them, or what should we do with them? They should be eaten. The scavengers will feast on their bones. So should we? Should I just pile them all in one place? No. It will be too easy a meal. You should take the bodies and put them in separate places. Take them deep right. into the woods, perhaps. That would be better. Okay. Thanks. So I'll walk back and... Okay. If anything, um, it doesn't get easier for you, Silas, from what she kind of points out. At one point, even telling you that the, the 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 most vital one you can pick out is that one that's still hanging from a tree, which is about 10 feet up. Uh, sure. Uh, short range. Ah. Thankfully, Druidcraft has a 30-foot range. Um, he'll uh, lean the staff up close to it and uh, open that one up or prep it. You hear a, a, a small sound from her and she rushes over to grab it. Not here. The ground is not good. And as you see her walk over and run over rather towards it, she takes three steps up the tree and grabs it with her hand. Not slowing one little bit. And with it, she kind of leads off a few more feet and points to a, another patch of ground. You can see that there's still some green moss growing here. Here, the water will be better. This is better for it. Files will just nod and do that. Thank you. You know the power, but you do not know the knowledge. Your teacher was bad. My teacher was not teaching me to protect the forest. And what were they teaching it to you for? To protect the clan. Clan? What clan? My people. Who are your people? You would not know them. They are known by few. But if they know these skills, they know this power, and they are not taught properly, I am not... I do not know if I can trust them. They do not... They cannot do this. I do this for them. Then you must take more care to learn more. You need a better teacher. If I have the time, then yes. But there's not much of that. And she kind of turns and, and throws her hands up. There's a sort of exasperated sigh. Humans, always in such a hurry. Because we're not given the time of elves. You should take more time. Be careful with your short lives. Before they are taken from you. Make an insight check. Oh, wow. <laughs> the rolls just keep on coming. Yeah. 
Um, she's distinctly sort of angry with you, and you get the intention, the 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 sort of notion that she's she's done with you for the moment. <laughs> she's not going to help you anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, it'll help with uh, putting the bodies out into the woods. Okay. Gold and uh, Dale are kind of standing by. Uh, so make sure they're not put near any waterways. Okay. How about Medric and Silas both make survival rolls for me, please? Oh, red. I don't think Let's you see. want to see that. Survival is plus two. Nice. Yeah. Very yeah. Nice. Perhaps for uh, Silas, it was something that Veer said, or or perhaps it was just the the vehemence with which she said said it. But you find some good spaces where um, a few rocks are built up, so it would have been conceivable they could have dropped right there, uh, and a few other places in the in the in the trees to kind of nestle the bodies in, far enough apart that if animals came, and this is a the essence you realize of what Veer was saying, is that it, the animals would come and feast, but not be near enough another to fight over it. And so lots of other animals are going to feast from these. Not entirely in different from the seeds she was uh, directing you where to put them. So they had space enough and soil enough to grow. For you, Medric, um, it's actually uh, Jordy who's with you, kind of helping okay. carrying these. Um, he seems a lot stronger than his size might suggest, but he does actually just use this massive axe cleave, uh, sort of heave it into the body of one of the, the hyenas and just sort of drag it along the ground. And then when it <laughs> comes to a certain point, he just flings the whole thing into the woods. That works. And the next one, he kind of wipes the axe off on and does the same. Time is passing. Have our buddies returned with the horses? Not yet. Damn. By now, though, the, the, the remains of the, of the burning wagon have been long pushed back and kind of carefully placed where they're not going to light anything else on fire. Uh, the road itself is clear. The wagon is still there. Um, but, and uh, the, you also would be clearing out the two horses that were there as well, the ones that were on the, the lead wagon. Yeah. That would require more chopping. Yeah. Uh, and just as much more. Jordy gets to that without even. It, it doesn't seem to bother him at all. It, you get the impression that either he's a butcher, or his dad is a butcher, or his mom's a butcher, or something like it's it's. Or he him. just likes being covered in blood spray. Yeah, he's pretty careful about it, but. Um, oh, you know, horse meat is edible. Uh, he looks at you. I know it. Vera doesn't. If like you want to keep. Oh. It's better not to cross Veer at this point. If we had hunted for it, she wouldn't be having a problem with it. The fact that they died from those things, eh, she'd have a bit more of it, more to say. Besides, this one's already a little singed. And he kind of cut, reaches down and rips off a hunk, and you see him quickly eat it. <laughs> it was probably part that got caught in the edge of the fireball or caught on the edge of fire. Yeah. They were too strong anyway. Meat's all tough. Well, that's a shame. Maybe some animal will make better use of it. It better. If an animal doesn't enjoy this, I'm tempted to come back and kick its ass myself. Not that I could probably do that. What's that fancy uh, symbol on your chest mean, anyway? It's a symbol of Ignis. Ignis? Oh, him? And he points up at the sun overhead. Nod, yeah. Oh. Oh. Oh, that's probably why it happened then. Yeah. You were not here when uh, the explanation was made. <laughs> I was too busy over there putting out the fire. Yeah. But um, I guess it happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like we were underground. That, that Those fires are much harder to put out. Been through that myself. Underground fires? Yeah. Like in a mine, or? Yeah, over a dim thurum. 
That's most of where my family's know, from. Do I know where Demthurum is? Uh, Demthurum is the large mountain not too far away. Okay, okay. gotcha. It's kind of a mountain range, but Demthurum is considered to be the tallest. Yeah. Don't we have like a crest from there? Uh, right on those tools. The tools. You found a few things that, that sort of point towards the dwarves. Um. So, is this the sort of thing you do often? Take jobs to find gnolls? No, just take jobs in general. Mm. And repel the darkness wherever work. it shows up. Repel the darkness wherever it shows up. Are you afraid of the dark? No, we just... Well, the darkness tends to bring bad things. Ka. Says a guy who never lived in the dark. <laughs> oh, some of the things we'd seen, yeah. We've experienced the dark a few times. It's not all bad. No, the dark can be quite comforting sometimes. Ah, it's a natural state. Half the time we're in darkness. Unless you're underground. That's pretty much all the time. Besides, not everything that shows up in the light is necessarily all that good. Present company accepted, of course. So uh, Silas will uh, put a hand over near uh, Medrick and say, uh, he's never in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> not when you glow like that. Yeah, I didn't want to say anything in case it was, I don't know, sore topic but no do, not do. at all and the eyes too mm -hmm. uh, thought you might have been some sort of genasi met a few of them once hotheads i mean both literally and they were just kind of impulsive <laughs> i haven't met any of them yet but thanks for the warning i'm surprised figured most of them would be in for ignis but then again I guess not every flame is for your cook pot, is it? I suppose not. <laughs> so is this is this what you do? You take jobs like this? Seems, I don't know, kind of minor for someone with nice fancy clothes like that. Well, we have to pay the bills somehow. I'm trying to reestablish the Temple of Ignis in Elfader, and that unfortunately costs a bit of money. <laughs> the previous one was destroyed in a Sea Devil attack. Oh, I heard about that. Nasty buggers, weren't they? Oh, yes. Um, unless you are initiating more conversation, I'm not going to just initiate more, but basically there's a lot of small talk about the area. Yeah. Um, you do learn that um, Rabbit Hollow is uh, not uh, not really all that close. It's probably about, as far as the road goes, it'd be about an hour and a half, but you can cut over land to get there in about 40 minutes, which makes it a little further than you might have expected. Um, from what they speak of the gnolls, um, they tend to be clever, but they're still animals predatory mostly uh sometimes bold so it is not uncommon or not unheard of for them to do things like attack uh, uh people on the road uh, i would ask them like what these have if they've seen those markings on gnolls before like pointing at the one that's got like, like all the tattoos the one that has all the tattoos is completely burned up however because that was right near the center of the of the fireball it's okay oh crap i thought we saved them or we have uh, no we, you saved two of the other guys, two of the, the minor yeah. ones. Mm -hmm. um, but the only uh, one that had, there was only one that had that sort of strange markings. I will make an okay. image of him. Okay. Who are you asking in particular? Ow. Sorry, cat. That was uh, Medrick was yeah. asking. Yeah. I'd ask... Uh, uh, well, Galt was the one that was talking to us most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'd ask him and... Uh, if I can, ask Veer, too. 
Okay. Um, Because she'd know like more arcane things. After a while, Vera does kind of come into the group, but she doesn't come close to the rest of you. She sort of does this weird, long, as far as she can, circle around everybody else uh, to come to stand very close to uh, Gauld, and Gauld wraps a, an arm around her. Uh, it seems to be the only the only person she really responds to, uh, and she kind of holds him close. Um, with, again, that sort of stare and glare. Um, when you bring up the illusion... Um, Silas, uh, Gauld kind of squints and looks closer at it um, and kind of peers in a little bit, trying to look around. Um, make a performance check to figure out how accurate your brief view of them actually was. Wow, okay. Um, it's seared into your memory from from uh, the, the even the distance you were at, even the... the, the Wait, you're at the other end of the of the bridge, so um, somehow you managed to, to see it fairly clearly. He was face to face with them at one point. Not with this one. This one was only up at the other end, um, and it was only one that looked like this. It, had it did come point. in closer, but yeah, I would probably be showing a picture of its partially burned body before it was fully consumed. Okay. Um, but Gold kind of leans in, and Veer following with with them they they both take a closer look at those and there's a a little bit of a look that passes between the two of them they catch each other's eyes and gold kind of nods and steps back can't say i've ever seen a knoll like that before um don't know what to say they don't normally do anything or they don't ever do anything like that it was casting some kind of necromancy magic Then it couldn't have been a knoll. Knolls aren't... They can't do that. Well, this Should one did. The knolls and the hyenas seem to... have some sort of magic on them, too, that disappeared when they died. And uh, it'll show a picture of one of them just with that purple smoke energy leaving. Um... Vera grimaces and says something in Elven. Annie, you recognize the word. You get the impression she did not realize that anybody spoke Elven here. Um, but clearly both uh, you and Gold hears it uh, and says something back in return. Um, Veer says, uh, Is it possible that's come this far? And Gold answers, It must have. Is the only explanation. Out uh, in common, uh, Gold turns to the rest of you. Uh, you're muted. I still. need more information on. Hmm? Sorry, you were you muted. I didn't catch anything. Oh, uh, I'll I'll respond in Elvin. What? What's gotten this far? Um, there's quite a surprise look An on. Peck on of Veer. Laugh. Quite a surprise on Veer's face, because um, she's she's looking at you with confused eyes and, and kind of squinting a little bit. Um, you get the impression she's she's kind of checking in particular around the eyes and around the ears. And from your court experience, it's the kind of look that elves often give when they're trying to figure out how much half elven you have in you, or how much elven you have in you. Because you must be a half elf if you speak, especially that that clearly. Um, Gold seems to just sort of nod. We saw some some lights deep into the forest, not far from the fen. Green, yellow, kind of a whitish glow. Some loud keening at night too. They didn't want to stay too closely. Veer took a closer look, but she couldn't see anything from where she was. And there were other creatures out there. I made her promise to come back if she'd seen anything really dangerous. Did there she? were shadows moving in the lights. Things large. Creatures I do not know the shape of. Creatures that are not found in these woods, in these hills. Massive. Tall. They're shapes were some like people 
Others like animals, and some like both. I could hear one coming my way, so I ran. I did not want to run, but I made a promise. I will not leave him. Gaul looks a little bit almost embarrassed at the naked sentiment that Veer just spoke, but the way that Veer spoke it was more matter-of-fact than anything else. We try not what to your life? that direction. What was that? What was that? Uh, what did it look like? And as she describes it, he'll basically he'll he'll do the um, kind of like the uh, police sketch artist thing, but with a uh, with silent image. So she describes a humanoid. It'll be a vague humanoid, and then she can describe parts of it, and he'll try to uh, replicate that. It was only in shadow that she saw, so it's it's hard for her to really okay. give much for detail. Um, she did say that uh, one of them seemed humanoid, as she describes it. Um, it it almost seems to have um, maybe three arms, but stands. Well, she couldn't tell exactly how large it stands because of the way that the shadows were moving, but it seemed to stand to be a dozen feet tall. One other creature she describes um, um, sounding as though it, it roared three different ways. Um, it made the sound somewhat like, like uh, a large cat, one of the hunting cats, and uh, a sound like um, a large snake. I do not know something that makes both of these sounds, but the third sound I did not know. It was not a creature that seems natural. And in seconds it was all gone. The light was vanishing, as were the shadows. There is something wrong with some of the land out there. I would go more, but I have promised not to. We have other and that was in the fence? It was nearest the fence, but I have seen it in different places at different times. Maybe this is closer. And she kind of gestures at the, well, where the image of the uh, knoll had been. We have seen the knolls be a little more uh, aggressive lately. Not taking on too many of the wagons on the road, but we've had our run-ins at the, at the camp from time to time. Usually they're just raiding, looking for anything they can get and carry off. They've tried to carry off a few people, but that doesn't usually go well for them. But there was a, It's been about a, a couple of weeks since we've seen any of them. It's like they were being controlled when they attacked us. There was this weird, like, dark purple shadow in their eyes. Controlled or possibly enhanced, but... That's Maybe it. a bit of both. Yeah. I'm going to go try and wake up one of the uh, gnolls. The one tied up in the unbreakable rope. Just to be on the safe side. Okay. Um, he's still very, very wounded seems to be uh, very deeply unconscious. How are you going to wake him up? Uh, first, I'll try shaking him a bit. Not hard, but just, I mean, the way you would try to wake someone up if they're sleeping. Okay. Um, I don't normally slap people awake. <laughs> um, and if not that... Uh, I'm gonna, I guess, maybe a medicine check or something. See if he can uh, find a way to wake them up without uh, aggravating their wounds. Wow, that, how is that even possible? Um, you um, shake uh, the uh, the knoll on the shoulder. Charisma. And uh, interesting. Yeah, and you uh, you shake them rather vigorously on the shoulder, and 
you get the impression, although the eyes didn't shoot open, they opened enough that you realize it's already awake, but trying to pretend to be asleep. But is very, very bad at it. <laughs> okay. Um... We're just going to, to look at it and then see if I can speak into his mind because my ability works as long as they know a language, even if it's not a language I know. Uh, basically, if they're capable of, of understanding a language, then the, tele the telepathy goes through. Okay. So he'll try that. What are you saying? Um... Let's try to, why, why did you attack us? You get the impression that it is speaking to you. It is surprised perhaps to, to hear you and it, its eye shoots open as it looks and tries to figure out how it heard you because it can't see your lips move and you kind of get a, a general huh and i'll say it slower in his mind why did you attack us Its eyes kind of swivel around as it looks at all the people, and you you feel it, or you see it kind of struggling against the ropes. Um, who tied them? I did. Okay, make a sleight of hand roll, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's. I am actually trained in that. He, he struggles against the ropes, but. Uh, and doesn't seem to be able to to wriggle out of them. Um, you uh, um, and it kind of starts to, to to whine and keen a little bit. All of you can kind of hear the the combination of the sort of if you imagine the the hyena like laugh, but more as an animal whimpering kind of combined together with a bit of, of frustration and anger. Uh, I don't think I'm capable of producing that sound, although I do hear a dog barking outside on cue. Um, uh, and the only response you get back to the sort of telepathic message is just this sort of urgent hunger, 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 hunger. And it is, it is desperately trying to, to free itself. Uh, Gall lifts up his axe, ready to strike it. Or his axe, I should say. Did I see his axe? Anyway. Is it saying uh, anything? Uh... It's just, it seems very hungry. Uh, what did we, what do we do with horse meat? Chucked it in the woods. Um, hmm. Annie and Medrick, you can make an insight check. <laughs> I'll handle it. Or I'll hand it some of whatever rations we had for the trip. And he's muted. Well, good news is it's above a five, but it's uh, a six. Still, still, still single digits. Oh dear. Okay. Uh, now do you catch that reaction? Then um, you toss it some of the trail rations. Yeah, whatever we had packaged to take along on the trip. Okay. Probably like a bit of that. Yeah, you know, dried bread and dried cheese and a little bit of dried meat. Yeah, I'll start with the dried meat. Okay. Um, it lands a bit beside it. It it uh, starts sniffing. It's the, and I haven't really described the knolls. I've kind of assumed, but most people uh, that most people have seen them. But basically, large dog-like head um, is the way that they. They have, they have a snout rather than just a mouth. Uh, and it does start to sniff at the at 
the meat uh, kind of sensing it nearby and kind of rolls itself over, um, let's see, uh, with with some with some uh, care, rolling itself over uh, to try to snatch at the meat, and uh, uh, manages to kind of uh, reach out with a rough tongue and 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 sweep it into its mouth and chew um, noisily, but kind of desperately. Chews it quickly down, swallows, begins to eye the rest of you, starts to struggle again. I'll look at it uh, again. Say, better? Uh, make an animal handling roll. Hey. Um, this time it comes uh, half desperate, half question. Hunger? 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 I'm not sure we're going to get much from them. They seem to be perpetually hungry. Veer you are walks... much more optimistic about this than, than I. Veer walks over to it and kind of um, sits down on her haunches so that she's more or less eye level with, with it. It watches her rarely. Um, Can you talk to it? She have today? Speaking of animal handling roles, I'll, I'll be right back. My cat keeps stabbing me in the foot for food. <laughs> BRB. Okay. I think Biscree rolled human handling roles there. Yeah. Biscree rolled a natural 20. That's where all the good rolls are going to, the, the cats. Um, she uh, um, looks at it straight in the eyes, and unlike when the way she's approached all the rest of you, here it seems almost like she's she's treating this, this knoll, this wild creature, like an equal. Um, and it watches her warily and kind of pants a little bit, almost in anticipation. Um, she um, reaches in towards her neck and pulls out something on chain. Um, it, it, it glints a little bit. It looks like it's got a little bit of silver to it. It's difficult to make out uh, clearly. Um, some of you, if you if you want to try to see it, it'll be perception and disadvantage. Yeah, I'll try to see it. Okay. I'm right next to her, so sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's not gonna do it though. Uh, oh, that 18. No, it's a it's a nine. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, you can't quite make out the shape. Um, she kind of. In, engulfs it in her hand and seems to say something but without really much voice um, it, it comes out almost as a as a as a woof, 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 woof. Um, and you see the the, the, the the creature's eyes go wide for a second and then relax as does the bodily posture of this creature uh, and she kind of moves forward now on her squat legs and brushes the fur gently on its uh, muzzle. It reaches out with a tongue and kind of opens up its mouth suddenly. And then the tongue just sort of wipes over the hand. And she kind of um, holds on to it. It is in pain. All right, kind of um, I'll, I'll give it a cure wounds. At level one. So you walk over to touch it. Yeah. It, it flinches back from your from your touch. But kind of with her reassurance, it seems to be okay. Okay. What is the D six? I'm pretty sure it's the D six. Where's my spell sheet? Ah. D eight. <laughs> right. D eight. Plus your wisdom. Oh, I wrote the wrong. Th okay. Cool. I was looking at the wrong line. 
Okay, it gets eight HP back. Okay. There is a burst of flame when you cast Cure Wounds, which does I'll take one to uh, to flinch a little bit. Let's see. But it seems reassured by Veer's touch. It should be in less pain now. Uh, its eyes move back and forth, mo looking at you kind of plaintively and looking back at uh, Veer. It's still in pain. It hungers. It hungers for so much more. She speaks to it a few more, a few more seconds. Again, kind of, kind of, uh, huffing and 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 whistling and and talking to it. It remembers. It remembers being on four legs. Now on two. And there was a promise. An endless meal. Promised by who? The laughing one. It's all he can think of. Uh, it must be another knoll or the shape of one. It stands strong. And all of this is kind of translated from yips and, and wool, uh, 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 laughs and, and, and growls. Uh, while she's doing that, Silas is going to cast, uh, what was it, uh, tones from uh, the staff. Okay. Um, let me just double check to make sure I know how much that gives you. I think it's literal interpretations. You're, you're muted at the moment. Uh, the wielder understands any spoken language and is understood by anyone who understands okay. at least one language. Okay. Wow, okay. That's that's uh, incredible powerful. Um, Cost me half the charges on my staff. Yeah, no, that, that's in this particular case, it's, it's fantastic. Um, as you start to understand not only uh, the, the, the Knoll, but also Veer, um, who is speaking to it. The, the, I will probably say things in full sentences, but again, translated from a very primitive form of language. Um, actually, yeah, that's kind of weird. Because it's really not a language as, as, a, as a human might understand it. Um, it's, not, uh, it's more of an animal tongue. But there is something there. It's halfway between, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, from Veer's questions, Veer, first of all, is questioning more and more about the, the laughing one and wanting to know where they encountered it. How powerful was it? How dangerous is it? Um, did it promise you things? Um, did it give you Was things? it the one with all the tattoos? Um, well... This is Veer and the Knoll's conversation, and Silas will hear it, and Silas can choose okay. what information uh, he's going to share. If Silas just starts spouting it out, the conversation will probably change. Yeah, no, Silas isn't saying anything. Okay. He'll let people know later. Because um, Veer is saying things from time to time, but Silas does notice that Veer is leaving out parts of the conversation. Um, whereas Veer is keeping it very, very simple that she translates to the rest of you about there is a powerful spirit called the Laughing One that uh, uh, is almost, uh, uh, as to these gnolls, is almost a god, is the way she would, she would kind of phrase it. Um, but Silas, she asks more questions about where it came from and make a, hmm, make an arcana roll. Not good. She's because she's talking with the this beast. Um, 
she can't use complicated languages or concepts. You wouldn't understand them. But what she is asking about it, or asking it, is whether or not it had seen a gap in the world through which another world had been seen. And if that's how they found the laughing one or how the laughing one found them. She does not say that out loud. To the others, uh, she says that the laughing one found them, gave them promises, but made them hungry. And that only once their hunger was satisfied would those promises of greater power be. And they would be elevated above all beasts. That was the ultimate promise. But she seems, the, the line of questioning, it, to the rest of you, it does seem as though, you know, it is, it is animals talking back and forth. And uh, it takes a long time to say a little. That's the impression you're getting. Because Veer takes a while back and forth kind of describing things to the, to the Noel and having the Noel speak back to her. Um, so your impression is that it's taking her a long time to get anything out of it. To you, Silas, there's a deeper conversation, a second conversation going on, where she's definitely trying to zero in on where this has been. Um, and I won't go through the detailed instructions here, but she describes, uh, or it describes, the pathway they came from their den to get here. Uh, and so Silas will make efforts to remember that. There are landmarks along the way, basically, that, that would be understood by a knoll. Some of them are smell, uh, uh, and some of them are sight. Some of them are sound. So it's a sort of series of sense impressions. Uh, with at least one landmark, which is a, a large stone that sits upright like a finger. Um, that's the only sort of concrete, real-world, um, normal human trajectory you're given. Um Make an insight check. Okay. Mm. Again, Veer only speaking in an animalistic way, but with your tongue's ability, you're able to pick up the, the subtle nuances of the emotion. Um, she seems to be desperate to find this location. Less concerned about the actual laughing one themselves, although out loud, again, that's what she's focusing on. But she's as desperate to find the location of the, of the tear or of the, the gap in the world. Uh, and it, it knows of a particular hill where it had run into it uh, and said that there were old stones there, a circle of old stones. Hmm, interesting. Um, hmm. After a while, Gold kind of leans down and puts his hand on her shoulder. She's been so intent on this, and her whole body posture has kind of moved. She's now kind of sitting on her knees rather than rather than crouching down. She's almost got a position similar to uh, a, a, a wolf or a, a hyena herself. Um, she's no longer uh, you know touching its head with her hands, but instead is sort of rubbing her head up against its in an almost loving gesture uh, and seems to be getting more and more familiar with this creature. Uh, but he puts his hand on her shoulder and she kind of turns and her head and she almost, she actually growls uh, to Silas. The growl is interpreted as what? Um, but there's a, a softness that enters her eyes when she realizes it's Gold standing in front of her. Um, and then she sort of nods. He needs to rest are you going to let him go? I don't know if there's much more we can get from them. We'll have to... Uh, uh, Nax, you seem to be silenced. Sorry, my microphone is not down. <laughs> can we trust them? Uh, yeah, that's my issue. Yeah, uh, I would just be worried that they'd attack someone else. He is not free of the hunger; it will consume him. Sounds like this laughing one gave them a shitty deal. And what type of life is that? 
Yes. The promise of something more, taken in a moment of desperate hunger. It is not his fault to have fallen for this. Greater people have fallen for less in desperate moments. All of you can make an inside check at that, too. Another nine. <laughs> 20. All right, is this is this one going to be the one? 15. Eh. Uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Well, 10. Um, why is Annie distracted at this moment? She's worried about someone else getting hurt because we let this creature out. Okay. All right, that that kind of I can I can imagine Annie kind of looking off into the distance. This is the in in some ways you remember your early lessons and they kind of resonate in a way that you didn't really expect them to. They were told to you over and over and over again. You're going to have to make hard decisions. It's part of rulership. Sometimes there are no right answers. And all of a sudden, that, that echo of a phrase comes back to you uh, in, a, in a painful way. For you, Medric, uh, you sense from her uh, a, a sadness and a recognition of what has happened here. She's seen this kind of, kind of victim happen before. She's seen this, uh, some, someone or somebody or something suffer from this kind of rash decision. Um, for you, Silas, um, you, you get that impression, but moreover, it's very close to her. This isn't something she had seen some, something happen to someone at a distance. Someone very close to her had this happen to her. Yeah. And she feels that pain and that bitterness. Does Silas feel that this is something akin to the warlock bond like he has? Um, An entity from another world promising power and, and such? Or does it seem different than that? I think that certainly a part of Silas would look upon this with an eerie familiarity that, that um, there's a parallel between the mother's promise to keep the family safe, um, but also making some demands and, and, and needing more, always needing more. Um, that does feel eerily familiar. But the mother's promises have more been kept than what you feel this creature has been given. And it may be because of the creature's pitiful status in life, its, its lack of true intelligence, whatever it happens to be, it was taken advantage of perhaps more than your people were. But that does give you pause to wonder, is it possible your people could be taken advantage of? I'm not saying that it's not a victim in this situation, but at the end of the day, and full control of its mind and will hurt people. Probably more people than the one life. Silas will look at Veer and, uh, and say, how far away do you think this spot is? It's probably revealing a little bit of information of what he had heard if she wasn't really talking about the spot before. She was not. Um, again, the kind of double speech that you were able to pick up on uh, definitely place this. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's the druid's version of the use can't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, kind of. Actually, that's a very interesting way to put it. Um, she looks at you, and there is a widening of the eyes as she realized what you 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 that you must have heard her. She catches it, but not before you're very much aware of that. For the rest of you, it's a little confusing, and and perhaps it's just this this weirdness of her stepping back from from the animal that she had kind of become. She stands up, and uh, Gauld kind of brings her closer to him. Um, she seems to to first look up at him, uh, and he kind of 
nods to her, uh, leans down actually and kisses the top of her head. Um, and she um, stands strong. It's this weird juxtaposition of her wanting to be held by Gauld, but at the same time wanting to completely and utterly be an independent. Um, so that's that sort of tug of war in her, in her stand. If you mean where the Laughing One is, I cannot say for sure. But it cannot be too far. It can never be far enough. Would it be possible for these ones to lead us there? And she looks down at the, the creature who's still looking up at her with um, with a look of, of, of care and familiarity. And then it kicks in on, on for you that she had cast a spell on it to make it like her. It was not just her natural thing. There's definitely something beyond that. Uh, and the other one certainly is looking at her with, with uh, uh, suspicion. You notice the other one is awake, uh, although in much worse shape than this one. I think he can lead us there. Are you willing to go? I think we need to talk. I'd be willing to go if I could rest and recover a little bit first. Uh, Sansa will come over and talk more quietly to uh, uh, actually he's going to try something a little different. He's going to have a, a conversation with them about how maybe this will help but he's not really going to say much direct. But in their minds, uh, he's going to be saying, um, uh, this won't take us to the diamond, but this, it sounds like something is going on out here that perhaps we should stop. So uh, in, in whose minds are you saying this? I don't like, understand. Well, in, in uh, Annie and Medrick's minds, he'll be talking but he'll be attempting to hold a simple, basic conversation normally. So it looks like they're talking about just an ordinary thing and no one knows that he can speak okay. into people's minds. Kind of like, um, in a way, what, what Veer was doing then? Double uh, he kind of. Probably a little more complicated because he's trying to talk in two different conversations at the same time. Okay. But uh, kind of like the audible conversation has been kind of, Hey, maybe we should do, uh-huh, blah, 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 watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Uh, but basically just secretly talking because nobody knows that we're on a mission out here to find the diamond and whatnot. Um, but he'll look at Annie and uh, say, I mean, I, th I feel like we have to do something about this, even if it's not connected to what we were doing before. If someone's using the the gnolls and the hyenas to attack people, oh, you're silenced. In my brain, I'll say uh, it might not be connected to our current employer, but it might have to do with what Kathron has us doing. Yeah, possibly, and I'll tell them. It sounds like it might be something like what I have with the mother, but less beneficial to them. Yeah. And this is like brain response to like, yeah. So, so we, we could finish the caravan conversation at the same time. I do want you to make a uh -huh. deception roll to try to keep the two of them straight because it essentially is you're lying in one voice and, and speaking the truth in the other. I've also trained in that <laughs> 19. Um, because otherwise you'll have large gaps while you're answering people in your head and not saying mm -hmm. anything aloud and it looks really suspicious. Okay. Yeah. I want to answer right now, then I'll answer later. <laughs> well, you can answer in the head and it, basically he can just talk in place of when you guys are talking. So he's just kind of, uh, 
talking along and, it's and just, whatnot. But. Because it is really two conversations happen at the same time. Uh -huh. Reception role is basically to be able to do it. If, if you yep. fail the role, it doesn't mean you necessarily blurted out loud what you were trying to say in your head, though. Uh, okay. A creative yep. response, potentially. Uh, if you just want to give an extraordinarily simple response, as in no, maybe, yes, that's okay. But if anything more than complicated than that, then it should have a role. That will go for Annie as well. Um, hey, that's not bad. Um, but what I was going to... Well, considering, considering that I have an 8 in this, let's see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, Don't jinx it. Natural 14. <laughs> hey. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so that's what... 22. Um, is Medric still exhausted? Yeah, I think so. Well, I don't know. Does it wear off like after an hour? Or? Um, it does not. God damn it. No, it wears off after a day. Of uh, course. Yeah, both there of you would nine. Have yeah, basically it's it's the, the coughing. So you're, you're in the middle of trying to respond and you accidentally try to speak out loud and in your mind at the same time. And you end up coughing and kind of losing the train, which everybody's kind of looking at you. Uh, and then the response to the fact <laughs> is extraordinarily simple. Um, you aren't, aren't able to kind of have that complicated conversation. Annie, however, uh, amazingly enough, is quite good at being duplicitous and uh, has no problem with this I say one thing and mean another kind of conversation. Um, it's almost all... like I'm proficient in it. Yeah, almost. <laughs> um, you do hear the clop, 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 clop of uh, horse hooves <gasps> coming uh, from the northern route. Uh, it looks as though Melora has uh, caught up with uh, that horse uh, and uh, you do not see Graveler and then you realize it's been longer than an hour. Yeah. So Graveler is long, long gone. Uh, but back in the order. Riding bareback, bringing back this horse. He's going, oh my God, I don't know what happened. Your friend disappeared. <laughs> uh, and I think it was, uh, uh, did Petrock, Petrock went with her too, so. Uh, he's actually riding on the on the horse as well. He's a lot less comfortable riding on the horse, and you you kind of note as they come closer that uh, Melora is looking a little uncomfortable because Petrock is grabbing onto her for dear life. Uh, but they come riding back, and she stops kind of at the edge of the of uh, the bridge. Uh, you've found some friends. Yeah, some friends found us. Um, yes, they put out the fire, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Well, I guess... Yeah, I think we've agreed that we... This uh, person needs to be dealt with. Otherwise, the roads are not going to be safe for travelers if they can lead us to him perhaps we can break the spell he has them under or it has them under i will go with you and gold just turns toward no i don't think that's a good idea and she gives him that look uh, yeah. the look of i'm going you probably shouldn't have said anything. We're going to talk about this later. <laughs> I mean, keep safe. I don't know what I'd do without you. Not enough. That's what you would do. And he kind of laughs. We'll keep her safe. She will be an asset if yeah. combat situations arise. You'd better keep her safe. If she doesn't come back or she's harmed, I'm going to kill all of you. And it kind of leaves that to hang for a second and then breaks into a smile. <laughs> hmm? It won't come to that, I'm hoping. No. Because if something happens to her, then chances are we're all dead anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, well, we won't let that happen. And hey, uh, and Medrick is trying to make a joke. If another forest fire starts up, then she can put it out. You get daggers from Beer, <laughs> who's looking at you as if, <laughs> as, if, as, if, as if, just give me an excuse. Just give me an excuse. <laughs> um, did I miss something? Says Melora. And immediately, practically falling off the horse, Petrock kind of lands 
he tries to make it look well actually let's have him have a roll I don't think I have him right offhand but I do remember his stats uh, <laughs> oh plans on his butt he tries to make it look graceful uh, but unfortunately uh, there's no stirrup on this and he kind of looked like there was supposed to be a stirrup and he goes tumbling into the ground he kind of rolls and, and stands up I'm all right I'm all right I'm all right um Dale walks over and kind of uh, greets the horse, weirdly enough. Uh, kind of, it, it seems to to uh, respond. It looks like he just fed it something, like a sugar cube. Where he got a sugar cube, you're not really sure, but that seems to Did be... he feed it wine? Uh, no, no. Uh, he's not going to have uh, horse lips on his uh, on his uh, his uh, wine skin. That does not seem like a good idea. Uh, but the horse seems to like him instantly, which, you know, horses, how can you trust them? Melora is also looking at him with a little bit of a suspicion, but climbing down. Um, who the hell are all you people? And introductions are given. We'll just go with that. So I'll just mention that they live in a rabbit hollow. They were finding stuff further camp, and they happened around a fire. <laughs> um. The other knoll is also trying to get away. It doesn't know what's going on here. Uh, it is going to try to first wriggle out of the ropes. Um, I'll need a, a, a roll to see who how well those ones are tied. I think Silas tied the last ones. Yeah. Yep, it's totally bound still. But you can <laughs> see trying trying to, try to inch your way, trying to get away. And it's making the same sort of whimpering noises, same sort of of uh, of fear and anger noises growling at anybody who's nearby. Um, uh, Veer, what should we do with them? I kind of agree to end with Annie, but the final decision's up to you, I suppose. And she looks at them with a lot of pity. Uh, the one who was trying to wriggle out of the ropes is now going to try to break through the ropes. It goes even worse. Um, and is now just trying to move away and kind of trying to inch away, literally getting no more than like five feet at a time, kind of trying to, to move away. Um, until the laughing one is gone, they cannot live. But we cannot assure the laughing one will be gone soon. They will lead us. Understood. And she goes over to the one that's growling once again kind of hunkers down, once again kind of reaches towards a, a something around her neck, um, concentrates for a moment, and its eyes kind of glaze over, and it calms down and looks at her. We need to go soon if we're going to go. Uh, just question to the DM, how dark is it out right now? Uh, it's about midday, a little after midday. Shit. Okay, so we don't have time for a long rest at all, do we? <laughs> oh no. Fuck. Maybe a short rest? <laughs> have we had the equivalent of a short rest while I'd we've been talking? Yeah, you've been talking and relaxing, so no one's been doing any heavy work since you tossed the bodies in the woods. That sounds okay. really bad out of context. Uh, so yeah, you can have the equivalent of a short rest. Some abilities reset during that. Yeah, and some regaining of hit points. Yep, you can spend some hit dice. But she seems intent on going now. If you want to change the timeline, you've got to talk. Nice. Oh, wait, those are D8s. Oh. Yeah, that was crappy. <laughs> That's half my hit dice. It, it, looked, it looked great for D4s. And I was like, oh, yeah, great. D4s healing. Oh, wait, no, there's a hit dice. Uh, okay, but I get back up to... Uh... Wait, no, I didn't. Let's see, 27. Yeah, you do add your constitution yeah. bonus if you have one. I don't have one. And she begins to uh, to bark and growl at the second one. How long does tongues last? Is it an hour? I believe so. Uh, let me see. Oh, no, 
show you the moves. I think I have it here. Yep, That's one hour. Right. Okay. So you understand that she's basically explaining that they are going to return back to the pack. Um, and the way she's phrasing it is they wish to, to join the pack. It's confusing to the creature, but um, actually I have her skills right here. Yeah, I'm back to full, but I have no hit dice left. <laughs> it seems here. confusing to the creature, but it seems to understand. And um, she promises it food. I will. Hmm. No, that's fine. I'll leave it with that. I have one use of suggestion every day, but I don't want to waste it at this point if it. <laughs> Might be useful later. On, 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 a, on a janky knoll. <laughs> yeah, it's like I could reinforce her uh, her commands with suggestion, but then maybe we might be able to use suggestion later because we're going to be like I have no healing left, and uh, I hardly have any healing left. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'll keep it for later. Okay. I just don't have healing. It... <laughs> It seems to be, uh, for the moment, it seems to be satisfied with her explanation and in a way almost eager to go. Um, yeah, again, kind of this weird bifurcated conversation that she's having. But she does kind of say exactly the same thing to you as she did to it. So she's being completely truthful in this case. Mm. Uh, yeah, well... Uh... Well, actually, we should probably explain uh, to the uh, caravaneers. Um, basically, the the gnolls seem to be controlled by something that's off in the woods. Uh, and we're feeling a need to go stop it before we continue further. Um, and we haven't seen any evidence of uh, what we were looking for yet. Petrock pipes up. I'm going with you. It's not going to be safe. There'll probably be more of these than what attacked us. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't just stand by. I've got to help. And Melora is looking at him. The caravan has to get to its destination. Yeah, that's my problem is I'm not going into the woods. I've got this to deliver anyway. Are you saying you're, you're leaving us to go after this thing? I think we have to. Think it's a danger to the area. If you want to just stay here until we come back. So that's what I was going to suggest. How far do we, does he think that the, the place is? We're we not could always park the caravan at Rabbit Hollow. The, the directions the gnolls use don't use all the same senses that we do. And they didn't seem to be talking about hours or days so uh, where how are you having this conversation like to who to whom are you including it's just having this out in the open at this point yeah. okay yeah uh, the, this, this part veer is veer is looking at you with some astonishment and is a mix of emotions there uh, shooting daggers probably is one of the one of the elements there um and she seems to be her and and uh Gauld step back a little bit and have a whispered conversation. Um, Dale steps forward. Well, if you need someone to ride with you all the way to wherever you're going, I I got nothing to do today. And Melora looks at him with somewhat su some suspicion. But I'd if these weren't sent by, I'd rather ride than than walk. That's for damn sure," says uh, Jordy. Could we park the uh, wagon? Yeah, because depending on how long it'll take, if you guys want to camp here overnight, if we're not back by by tomorrow, then continue. I mean, there's all kinds of dangerous things that come out at night anyway. It's not exactly the safest place to stay just on the road here. And Melora... Uh, 
looks still dubious at him, but um, look, it's it's safer if we get our package delivered. That way we can stay in town there and come back tomorrow like we were planning to do anyway. I don't really okay. feel like I want to be camping out here. Perhaps we can meet you at Rabbit Hollow then. Wherever that is. It's not that far from here apparently, but uh, on the way Did back. We leave the wagon at Rabbit Hollow overnight. Well, no, I think they should go deliver the package and then on their way back, just stop at Rabbit Hollow for a day and see if we can meet up with them. Yeah, the original plan I'm just was to, to take the wagon all the way out to uh, Lake Olam, which is a day-long trip. So you go there, drop the stuff off. You're not expected to come back that day because it would be too late in the evening. Um, Lake Olam is a, is a little farther to the east and is, is on a secondary road, which spurs not far from here. Whereas the camp is on the western side of the King's Road. So these aren't that close together. Um, just to keep that. I'm worried the caravan will get attacked if we go our separate ways. They could be attacked even if we, uh, even if they stay here. If we all go to Rabbit Hollow together, then we leave for wherever the spot is. It would be. We safer. don't know the directions to the spot from there. Isn't. We'll they are going to lead us with the knolls. We're, yeah, we shouldn't take the knolls into Rabbit Hollow. Well, no. Look, Dale and I can and can help Miss um, Melora, Miss Melora here, get everything to where the hell are you going? Lake Olam. Who the hell goes to Lake Olam? Anyway, we can get you there. We can travel back the northern road. It cuts rather than coming all the way back to the King's Road. It cuts towards Dem Thurum and then comes back that way. Who knows? Maybe I know a few people in Dem Thurum that can give us something to carry back on the way, too. That way, your caravan is safe. You go off and do what the hell you're going to do in the woods. Just be careful. There, there's a lot of reports of things being attacked. Yeah, or caravans of, being attacked on the road. A lot of unsavory people along the road. He kind of looks pointedly at you. <laughs> never, know, <laughs> never know what the hell they're going to do. Before they leave, though, I will, I will pick up the graveler, the, the, the graveler orb. Because that's coming with me. Okay. Yeah, this strange, large uh, stone with studded crystal in it. Pop, pop that back in your bag. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you are taking some of the uh, stuff for yourself, says Dale. Oh, that, that's that been mine the entire time. Well, not uh, mine, but oh. ours. Sure. I know who takes what souvenirs. Not going to say a thing. Cool. Even if you do, there will be no consequences, because it's mine. <laughs> sure. You just keep saying that to yourself, and I'm sure somebody will believe it. Roll my eyes. Still no sign of Stefan, Kara, and the other horse. I can't. Have to wait. No, that's also my, my worry. Yeah. yeah. Gold says, I'm, I've got to go back to the camp tonight. I I can't go to Lake Olam. And I've got to go report back what I've seen anyway. We've got to know that we've got to prepare for some other kind of knoll attack. Could you take the wagon to the camp? I don't know if it's safe there either. They're the going to have to wait for the other four horse to show up anyways. If the gnolls are attacking this side, they may very well come for the wagon too. Yeah, but you can't move the wagon without the second horse. She can probably manage it, but... Um... Still, I'd rather know that Stefan and Kara are all right, says Melora. So That's part of why I was suggesting you guys stay here the night. That way, because you're not going to, if you wait much longer, you're not going to be able to get to, to where we're going. My 
me the player forgets uh and then like something <laughs> <laughs> like all of them yeah the the like uh but at the same time i don't feel comfortable leaving without knowing that the other two are okay and as you kind of find yourself in this this conundrum um It's actually Gold who would notice first. There's advantages of being very tall. <laughs> Is that them? And he points down towards the other road. And indeed, you see the other horse um, trotting along this way, trotting kind of carefully. Um, and you only see one person on the back of the horse. You recognize Kara, um, kind of from the, the, the shape of her. And as they get closer, you realize that there is another person on the horse. It looks like Stefan has been kind of laid across the front and they're going a bit slow so he doesn't slide off because, again, no saddles. Um, That's not good. Kira rides a bit closer. Uh, he's not so good off. Is that? Can any of you help him? What happened? Silas will try and help him off, but... Silas is not strong. He's he's unconscious. Um, and you can see that he's got a fair amount of, of blood on him, and there's a fair amount of blood on the horse as well. Um, you remember that he was attacked by a couple of the gnolls. But as you move closer, you also notice that uh, he's got a massive bruise on his forehead. Uh, Stefan got a bit angry with the horse, and it was very scared. I see. Ish. And you can see a massive bruise. At the very least, it's going to have a bit of a headache. Yeah. Can I do a medicine check? Like, I'll help. Wait, can somebody help me get him off the horse? Mm -hmm. I'll ask that other tall dude to help me. Because yeah, I'm Gold. still feeling exhausted. Gold can definitely help you. In fact, he, he, he lifts him almost without any effort. <laughs> okay. Um, kind of sets him down gently on the, on the ground. Wow. And he pats the side of the horse. Good shot. <laughs> and you can see like a, a clear hoof print right on his forehead. Yeah. He's lucky to be alive. Yeah. It's not his fault, says Kara. A lot of that really frightened him. Stefan, I mean, not, not the horse. I mean, the horse is not all that good off either. And Veer has, at this point, walked over to the horse. Veer and, Di and Dale both on either side of the horse. And the horse is getting very, very calm. Um, and you see again that Dale feeds something to the horse. So, are you taking a look at him? Medicine check? Yeah, medicine check. Uh, I... Wait. It's like disadvantage for everything, but there's shit rolls anyway. 11 is enough to know that he will have a concussion. <laughs> He's got an indent in his forehead now. The scar probably will go away, but there will be a, a reminder of it most likely. Um, he's going to need to be cared for. He can probably ride in the back of the wagon. As long as they don't hit any potholes. Luckily, he doesn't have to drive the second one. Yeah. It's fair. It's that uh, smoking pile <laughs> over there. So, what are we doing? Are we going now? It's probably best. I say, I look at the the head caravaneer person, Melora. Sure. Uh, and to, look, do what you folks have to do. Uh, we'll be back as soon as we can, but uh, I think we need to we need to stop whatever is going on here. There's something weird with those gnolls, and if if it's happening to more than just these ones, then the roads are just going to get more dangerous. The woods are not safe. You see a, a, a sort of unhappy response from Veer and Gold at that. 
you get the impression that that hurts in, in a way that was unintended. Um, almost as though they'd, they'd, they'd seen them be safe or they felt they were safe, but they realized... It was more of a throwback to the first campaign. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, the woods are never safe. Uh, I'm just worried because uh, like this is... So I could give Stefan a heal, but then I have no level one heals left. And I want to use a... So I got like one level one slot and two level two slots left, and I want to cast like Lesser Restoration on myself at some point because rolling everything at disadvantage is just not fun. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know, like, should I heal him and... Well, getting rid of exhaustion is a greater restoration. I thought it was lesser. He got rid nope. of one level. Nope. Fuck. No, lesser gets rid of a disease or a number of... Uh, a number of... Um, conditions. Other things. Conditions, yeah. But you need a greater to get rid of a, a level of uh, exhaustion. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to be though. useless in this next fight, y'all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Stress gets rid of it. But it won't affect your attacks or your spells. We'll just be low on spells. Yeah, it's only ability checks at this particular point. So, All right. they're looking to you to decide what to do. Melora seems inclined to press on to Lake Olam. Dale and uh, uh, Jordy have volunteered to go with her. Gald is going to go back to the camp. Veer is coming with you. Kara and uh, actually Petrock is going with you, or wants to. You can tell them not to if, if you want. Uh, Kara is traveling with Stefan in the back of the wagon. And her inclination, if, if asked or if consulted, is to go to Lake Olam because they have a town there. And they have healers there, and they have beds. Yeah. And she's she does seem yeah, concerned St about Stefan. Stefan's condition changes that they they should probably go to the lake, and we'll go find them there. You. What we were doing. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully, uh, our employer will not be dissatisfied with us if we're not showing up with the caravan at the lake. Yeah. And hopefully the caravan will get attacked on the way to the lake. <laughs> yeah. Um, Melora so. specifically mentions the, the village of Drift Clear, which is on the edge of Lake Olam. That's where they're supposed to deliver the packages. That's where she intends to be. Um, if you're not up if you don't catch up with them tomorrow her intention is to ride back with the result actually to ride sorry to ride over to meet you at the uh rabbit hollow because that's where you said you okay. would be and dale and um jordy don't want to walk back so they're also pressing for that solution <laughs> at the end of the day the, the mission we're currently on benefits us as well. So I do intend to continue. It's just this seems like something that is for the greater good and make our issue because we're dealing with one thing instead of two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is that the plan? Is that line? But, anything else you but explained change? much more eloquently. Sure. <laughs> Who are you explaining that to? Sorry. Um, Laura. Okay. She seems she's not happy about it, given that you were already attacked, but uh, and she doesn't really know Dale or Jordy. Uh, but from what you said of them, I mean, both of them seem to be personable people. That seems to be who they are. But Dale's uh, a bit curious, but otherwise, fine. the fact that Jordy stepped uh, in to help uh, fight uh, the fire. Uh, Sorry? Uh, I'll let them know that Dale was trying to peek at the, the crates. <laughs> yeah, she rolls her eyes at that. Let him try. <laughs> um, so, any other modifications to what I said or any other nuances? I want to make sure I got it correct. You, Petrock, Veer, uh, are going with the Knolls to go to find the Laughing One. Everybody else is heading off to 
Lake Alum, oh. except for Gold, who's going directly back to uh, Rabbit Hollow. How much HP does Petrock have? Because <laughs> I recall that he didn't have that many after the fight was over. Uh, Petrock had gone down at one point. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, even without a medicine roll, you can tell that he is very, very badly wounded. Uh, Petrock, maybe... Actually, I gotta double check to see it's what his maximum is, but I don't not a good idea good. considering uh, the shape you're in right now. Make sure I, I tell Petrock that his friends might need his strength in defending them on the way back. Mm -hmm. You can try to convince him otherwise. He's certainly set on going wherever the uh, the Phoenix Champion goes. Uh, uh, Petrock. You should really accompany the wagon. It's not that I don't want you here, but uh, sometimes, at some point, the Phoenix Champion is going to go in somewhere and, and, and isn't going to come back. I get a natural okay. twenty to uh, tell him that his friends will need to, his caravan friends will need him to help defend them in case they get attacked. So the response to Medric's plea is more or less, "I have to be there. If you go down and I, I had, I was able to save you, then." I could never forgive myself. So it seems to be almost encouraging him to follow with. But, God damn it. Uh, but when Silas, you kind of point out that, first of all, that Stefan is badly wounded, uh, that uh, Melora and, and Kara are going to need you, and there's a bit of, well, maybe they will, and then maybe, a, I don't know if you cast a little shade at uh, Dale or, or, uh, or Jordy. Certainly Annie was keen too. And uh, Silas is, is completely positive. This is like, uh, they will need you to defend them, that sort of thing. So he, he looks vastly disappointed, but kind of shakes his head. All right. Um, maybe another time, Medric? Definitely. I mean, there were... the issue with this cave or this location, there will be other gnolls, and right now you can't take a hit anymore. I could heal you up to optimal health, but I have very little left of the power of Ignis for today. And I'll look around at the devastation. <laughs> <laughs> kind of shakes his head. Well, I'll try not to die helping these folks then. Good man. You sense a bit of bitterness in that response, but he is going to go off with uh, Melora and Kara and Stefan. And Jordy and Dale, I'm amazed I remembered all of their names. <laughs> uh, while the rest of you make your preparations, and next time we'll set off in search of the Laughing One. And that's where we're going to end for this evening. Well, guys, had a fire that could put out. Now you're being chased after another fire. What could possibly go wrong? Everything's on fire. Yeah. <laughs> but now I got no more fire. I have no more fireballs left. So there's there won't be so, the, the, so what you're saying is the forest is safe. Yeah. <laughs> Unless well, burning hands is a 15 foot cone, and I have one of those left. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I'll try not the to. The forest is safe for today. Yeah. And, and, and since Vera is with you, at least uh, if she has any more power left to intervene on the forest's behalf, she might be able to protect the forest from you. Who knows? I have a feeling the hailstorm cloud is going to appear right above my head. <laughs> uh, it's actually sleet storm. That was that particular spell being used. Okay. Yep. Uh, which, ex which explicitly t says it, it, it doesn't do any damage and it puts out fires. It's, it's literally the druid equivalent of the fire brigade. Um, nice. Uh, it was <laughs> kind, of, kind of funny. It's unfirewall. Uh, kind of, yeah, yeah. All right, folks. Uh, thanks very much for those who are watching. Um, you can watch this every Sunday, streaming live on twitch.tv slash ENCAF1. That's at 3 o'clock Atlantic time. Um, check your local listings to figure out if your time zone supports daylight savings time or not to see whether you had been off by an hour. We're all off by an hour, it feels like. You can also find episodes recorded and posted up on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ENCAF1. Look for the playlist, either the Legends of the Drowned Isles, which is the master playlist, includes all the episodes from the previous campaign, as far as we've gotten, and, or you can look at uh, Legends of the Drowned Isle, Campaign 2, The Great Confusion. That's just this campaign.
thanks again to my players for playing today. Thanks for running. A whole whack of NPCs. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta remind myself not to introduce uh, six NPCs at the same time. Oh boy. And we shall play again next week. <laughs>